Funny's Not Dead. Welcome everybody to Funny's Not Dead, Surviving COVID. I'm here with one of our celebrity comics, Hank Hardison. I'm pronouncing that right? Yeah, right, yeah. right, right, Hank. Um, man, I met you, God, it's been a couple of years now, at Sebast in Sebastopol at Hot Monk. Yep. You know, one of the open mics there. I mean, John Lear uh, hosts uh, every third, third, uh, third Thursday. Sunday. Or third Sunday, excuse yep. me, each month there at the Hot Monk in Sebastopol. And man, I was so hungry to know and learn about this craft. You know, yeah. I, I've always had a, a funny sense of humor, and you know, all my old friends said, "Man, you eventually need to do stand-up comedy." So I just immediately, you know, was drawn to you. I saw you perform. So this show is about helping those who want to get into the industry, either in acting, comedy, uh, even in modeling. Yeah. Um, it's more for the two U's, the unseen and underdogs. Yeah. You know, so I want to talk about where the vision first started with you. Was it early in life, later in life? Did you do stand up comedy? It was uh, basically we started off. Uh, I was always in high school, of like class clown, how I think all of us kind of are. You know, instead of listening and doing what we're supposed to be doing, we're popping off and making a joke, you know, to get the class to laugh and, instead of actually, you know, passing our grades. Uh, so once I, uh, I dropped out of high school, then I realized I had to do something, you know. And uh, just years of, we'd go out with our friends and, and have a good time. There'll be a whole bunch of people camping or whatever. And uh, I did just gravitate towards getting everyone laughing or telling a story. And uh, one of my close friends, I had always said, oh, I want to do stand-up comedy someday. I want to do stand-up comedy someday. Mm -hmm. And like we all do. And then one of my friends who's a very successful actor, he's a he is the probably the most like third person in every film you've ever seen. Like he's the guy who's the sheriff's assistant in every movie you've ever seen. And uh, he just he him and his wife go, We're signing you up and we're taking you down there and you're gonna do it. And it was within like 30 minutes. I had no choice to back out and and I said, okay, and I Drove from Napa to Vacaville, which was 30 minutes, and was jotting down ideas as I was driving, texting, driving, don't do that, kids. Um, and then literally just stuff off the top of my head. Got there, uh, signed up for the open mic as scared as everyone who ever does it. You know, I was nervous, didn't know anybody, and uh, the guy who started me off was super nice, and nobody else showed up and signed up for that day. And so he was like, well, we got a lot of people here, and you're the only comedian and uh, luckily, right before the show started, a bunch of people came in, comedians rolling, right? We're, we're not the most like punctual <laughs> and, or reliable or most things. And um, it just happened that they all made me go first. You know, they were like, first, you're the new guy, you're going first, right? And so you take the bullet, which was the first. Uh, and I didn't know at the time that like 10 minutes was a long set, you know, like when you're first starting. And I was like, he goes, oh, you can do 10 minutes? I was like, I have no idea what I could do, right? And uh, so he goes, you're going to do 10 minutes up front of everybody. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, fine. Not even knowing what I was agreeing to. So I go up on stage and I still have video of it, of that night. And I went up there and stars aligned or whatever happened. And I mean, it went, I went right into a tirade of holding my cocktail and just, I, that crowd was insane. Laughing, having a great time, rolling. And, and after it was all done, you know, I was, I couldn't even believe it. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And uh, the guy came down, B.A. Uh, Hunter, afterwards, and he goes, that was your first time you've ever done this? I said, I've never been on stage before. And he goes, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Nice. And he was one of those people, which is like what we and you and so many other people should be doing in comedy and all these things is we, he took me in and he said, here's the shows you need to go to, here's the places you need to go, here's the people you're going to talk to. Within six months, I was doing shows for, you know, featuring for people and famous people. It was awesome. So, nice. pretty quick. So, give me some highlights. Who have you worked with, like, that was memorable and, and some places in your first eight gig? Oh, man. So, uh, I've had very fortunate. Within six months, I, la I was doing advertisements for, uh, I had to go on a radio show. Uh, this theater that I booked, I decided, I decided I'm going to do my own shows. And I was like, hey, look, I, I got this idea. I just wanted to do it, you know? Like, you're doing this with your show. You have a vision. I said, okay, we're going to do it. And so the, the theater guy who owns it, he's the DJ for 1440 KVU in Napa. And so, Barry Martin. And he said, uh, he goes, hey, I need you to come in and do some promo spots and radio interviews and whatnot. So I said, okay, I've never been on radio either. So I go on there, did a radio interview, and then did the morning, did the drive time, and then did the nighttime person. And after I was all done for the whole day, the 
the owners of the radio station came in, they go, have you ever done radio before? And I go, nah, man, I hate the sound of my voice when I hear it. And they go, you have the perfect voice for radio, which I thought they meant the perfect face for radio, you know? <laughs> and uh, so they, gave, they, they said, hey, let's put an idea together for an hour long show and do whatever you want. And that was the birth of the Hank Carter show. And we grew that into, uh, I mean, we were number one in a uh, comedy podcast for a long time uh, on iTunes, we're still on iTunes now. Had that for two and a half years, interviewed porn stars, famous actors, comedians, and it was a blast. I mean, really launched me like, to that next level. And through that, I got to work with uh, Kevin Farley, who's Chris Farley's brother. We all know Chris Farley from Black Sheep and all this stuff. And Kevin is, they, is five brothers, and they all look identical, and they all sound identical. And so I got to feature for Kevin at the Tommy T's in Sacramento for a whole weekend, so five shows. And uh, that was a great, like, launching kind of thing. And one of the greatest things about it was we all have our jokes that we think are, like, great. And you go to a crowd, you perform, people go, that's a good joke. Uh, but that guy has been in comedy forever. And he's backstage as I'm doing my final Ender one, the, the Muppet joke. I don't know if you've heard that one yeah, before. Yeah. So I'm doing the final joke. And, I'm, and you can hear Kevin backstage losing his shit. Like, he's laughing so hard, and I'm trying not to, like, lose my thought process, and he's just crying backstage laughing. And I get all done, and as I walk back, and the host comes up, and he comes and he goes, that was the funniest shit I've ever seen. And I was like, now that's cool, you know. Uh, but the height of it was right before COVID. Uh, the person who was, that I wanted to start comedy and, and work with was Adam Carolla. And right before COVID, uh, I talked with him, worked with his show a lot, and uh, he, they booked me to open up for him at the Uptown Theater in Napa, which is my hometown. And so we had 750 people at the Uptown Theater in my hometown, and I got to feature and do 20 minutes in front of Adam Carolla, and that was like that, the, as good as it gets, you know? So, and then COVID hit, and then everything uh, turned to shit. <laughs> All right, so yeah, let's talk about that. COVID, how'd you keep your craft alive? How'd you keep things going? Uh, porn and OnlyFans, mostly. <laughs> Mostly, mostly OnlyFans. Uh, it's, a, it's surprising what people want to see you do with a microphone. Uh, but that was that was a highlight. Uh, but no, it was mostly nothing. I mean, really, the clubs were dead. I was down. I went back and forth to LA. There wasn't a lot we could do, so we were trying to produce more content, like online. And then, while right before COVID hit, I was meeting with people to do a four um, episode show for uh, Netflix. And uh, COVID hit. Everything stopped. And it kind of took a lot of the wind out of my sail. Like I was just like, man, is this what I want to do? I got my son, one of my sons here. I got two boys, I got bills. Like, can I keep doing this? And um, sure enough, like right as COVID, like about a year in, people start contacting me and said, hey, are you gonna still do that show? Are you gonna still do that show? And I didn't, worked out a guy who at the theater, he goes, let's move it. And it, within a week, things fell into, we had someone filming it, we had sound, we had the crew, we had everyone together and sold half a theater and filmed the four pilot episodes, and then it just kind of, I said, well, maybe this is what we're gonna do. And so for the last year and a half, we've been doing more TV, doing more shows and trying to get more stuff done on the TV side. Nice. And then stand-up is just, you know, I, I try and make it out as much as I can to all the shows that book me, and then work on the material and, and try and make sure that I still am telling some funny jokes, and that's about it. <laughs> So, new comics, they yeah. want to get into this, what are the suggestions, what do they need to do, and how do they keep grinding? Talk about that a little bit. Uh, that's easy. <laughs> it's, it's easier than, than it is to, to do. Uh, really, if, if you ever want to get into comedy, and it's something that you're really passionate about, like, it's got to be something that you're really passionate about, that you go, I think what you're asking for, you're just not aware of how general you're asking. Clarity is power. The more clear you are about exactly what it is you want, the more your brain knows how to get there. Your brain is a servo mechanism. It's like a bomb. Those bombs, those missiles, they have a servo mechanism. So if the target moves, it knows what the target is, it follows it. Your brain, when you condition it, knows exactly what to go for and it'll find a way to get there. Do you ever buy a certain outfit or a certain car and suddenly see that car outfit everywhere? How many of you ever had that experience? Say, aye. How come that car outfit's everywhere? It always was everywhere, but now you notice it. And the reason is because there's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system, the RAS. That part of your brain determines what you notice and what you don't notice. Your brain spends most of its time trying to make sure you don't notice because you'll go crazy if you notice everything. But when you decide what's most important to you, your brain goes after it. Everyone I know who's successful builds what I call an RPM plan. An RPM is built on the metaphor 
that the way to get from where you are to where do you want to go to the fastest is you've got to build power, like in a car, RPMs. And the R stands for they know the result they're after. They know what they want precisely. If you don't know exactly what you want or you let yourself get beyond that into something general, you're not going to achieve it. Clarity is power. You've got to know the specific result you're after. What do you want? If you can't answer that question right now in your personal life, in your body, in your relationships, in your finances, in your spirituality, then you're not going to be as fulfilled as you want to be. Today we're going to have you answer one of those questions at least. The second part of it, you've got to know P, why you're doing it. Because you know what? You may get a big goal as soon as I want to make a billion dollars. I want to bring peace to the earth. Why? Because as soon as you come up with a goal, all the obstacles show up. And unless you've got enough emotional drive to break through that, you're never going to discover what it really takes. So you've got to get yourself past that. And the way to get past that is have enough reasons. Reasons come first. Answers come second. This man did not know what he wanted. He did not have enough reasons. To ask intelligently, you've got to ask specifically. To ask intelligently, you've got to know why you want it, have enough drive to make it happen, enough juice to make it happen. If you don't have enough reasons, you will not make it happen. And the M is, what is your massive action plan? What is going to get you to actually fall through? Because the first plan's not going to work, and the second plan's going to work, so you better have enough plans that if the first two don't work, you still got something else. Otherwise, you're going to be having excuses why it didn't work. So asking intelligently requires that. So if we're going to be extraordinary in our results, we've got to be in an extraordinary state. We've got to know what we want, and we've got to go use it. I want to do this because you end up driving everywhere all the time. Uh, I had a video, I used to do these compilations of all the video I put together and the miles that I drove when I first started that first year before I started getting booked on feature shows where I could choose and I was turning away jobs. That first year will tell you if you're any good. Okay. If, if you don't get booked on a, on a show and people like Casey or, or people that you're performing for don't book you, you're, you're either not telling the jokes right or you're not, the, the personality's not right, whatever else. And so you have to go and keep trying, and keep trying, and keep trying until the people in the crowds are laughing. And that, that'll tell you anything. It's not like, you know, there's a lot of things that are subjects and people can have ideas and opinions. If you're on a stage and you're telling your jokes and no one's laughing, a lot of people go, oh, it's a tough crowd. No, it's not. It's you. Gotcha. You know, and I, and so you just, but the key is grinding it out. Keep going. Listen to people. You know, I get some of the great feedback I get from someone is one of the, uh, uh, Juan Carlos. We both know him. Great comedian here in the Bay Area. He told me something that was changed how I performed, which was people don't know you. So I'm a big guy. The way I look when I walk on stage, people have assumptions of you. We were each wearing our, a uniform or a costume, right? So they look at you and they go, I'm already making these judgments. It's just as if we're walking down the street. Same thing happens when we get on the stage. They're assuming you're funny because you're there. But that only gets you about a minute. And then if you're not funny, nothing's going to happen. But if you're telling jokes that don't match with what you look like, it's not going to go anywhere. If I start telling these people and, and I look in a crowd, I go, oh, I got some some older people, some younger people, and I start telling some dirty, filthy jokes, well, they're going, oh, oh, this is, you know, not for me, or whatever else. You have to know the audience that you're performing from, and you have to know yourself. Because if you get on there and you start saying, oh, I'm on these dating sites, and I can't meet anyone, and I can't do anything, and uh, you're a good-looking guy, people go, oh, this is not right, you know? So that's pretty much the best thing I heard, you know, from Juan. Nice. All right, so now you're producing shows, you've been producing shows, now you're Napa producing shows. Tell us where you're at and what's going on there. Okay, so in Napa, basically, uh, we do theater shows at the Lucky Penny Theater. If we're, uh, that's, uh, we got a good arrangement work with those people. Uh, Barry's great for creating shows, uh, works with me on all kinds of stuff. Um, we do, I, I was very fortunate to meet Jeff Traeger, who's the, actually the guy who found, how many of you guys know uh, the, the band Journey? You know, one of those Journey? All right. I think we've heard of them. Yeah, done yeah. A so songs. Steve Perry, the lead singer of Journey, Jeff Trenger found him bagging groceries in a grocery store and introduced him to the rest of the band. Nice. And so he produces shows, music acts all over the Bay Area, Mare Island, at the theaters, everywhere. And he's been doing, he's like, I always call him, he's our, our little Jewish Billy Graham. Like, he, <laughs> he, like he, he's amazing. And he can put a show together. And uh, he, he reached out to me. We had a great relationship. We still do. And uh, we do shows at the Downtown Theater in Fairfield. Um, but right now we're working with uh, Cable Access in Napa to film. They're giving us a studio, cameras, and all the equipment to start filming these new TV shows. And so we're gonna be doing, in August, we'll be shooting four more pilot episodes of my show, Swiped, uh, to be taking that to Netflix. And then we have 
uh, a new show that I'm going to be releasing with Edsel Mack uh, called, uh, well, I can't even say what the name is yet, but we got that one coming out, and then we have a skit show, which is my radio show turned into just skits, which is like if you ever uh, Key and Peele or The Chappelle Show, it's going to be about 15 minutes of us sitting down talking just like the radio show was and, and everything else, and then we go into all the skits. Nice. Well, man, we got some similar things going on because we have a bunch of actors and comics yep. and models that are doing comedic skits throughout the Bay Area as well. And, and we're going to be uh, filming a lot of Bay Area bands. There's some diamonds in the rough. I tell you, you got to hear some of these bands that are coming forth to be on the show. I want to thank you so much for your time and coming out and doing hey, this. Thank and, you. and folks that are here, you get to be honored to have them play for you guys tonight. He's going to do a set. And uh, we'll put a little bit of that on this episode as well. Awesome. Any comments, questions, or about oh, for me, man? Hey, man. Congratulations, and I hope this is going to work out oh, great. It's going to work out. I, lo I love seeing everything going. Sorry, right, man. Just if anyone's out there doing comedy, you got to keep grinding. Keep grinding. That's about it. Cheers. All right. He's performed all over the place and worked with uh, some of the funny, like you worked with Felipe Esparza, Adam Crolla. And you're going to love him. And I'm going to bring him up here right now. So please welcome my friend and soon to be yours, Mr. Hank Hardister, everybody. Oh, he started back there. Oh, look at that. Quarantine was kind of rough. Uh, we had to get through that, right? I don't know if you guys are like me, you learned a lot about yourself during quarantine. Uh, I learned I was a fucking liar. Uh, I was told myself, if I just had enough time, I would write a novel, do something constructive, and uh, better with my life. Uh, no, actually fucking, you give me all the time in the world, I'm going to masturbate incessantly and watch Tiger King. And that's, that's about all that fucking happened with quarantine, right? Fucking lying to myself. I'm here to call you out. Meditating witch. I see you come not one, but many slime demons. Well, I get by with a little help from my friends. Now, listen here, fellas. We don't want no trouble, so just move on through. Now, look here, young man. I'm the sheriff of this here county. Oh, oh, oh. Hold up, hold up. Rewind that. Go back, go back. Let me see that one more time. Now look here, young man. I'm the sheriff of this here county. Oh! No! <laughs> that had to hurt his scroll. I know he's embarrassed. Make him meet his spirit guide. Woo! He shouldn't have done that. He done messed around and got Guru Merkaba mad, baby. Come on, Guru. Question. Where do you think you're... Wait, wait. Hold up, Guru. Capital my ass! You ain't so bad now, are you? Looks like you made him meet his spirit guides, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>